Harriet Tubman, Chapter 3, Six Years Old By the time Harriet Ross was six years old, she had unconsciously absorbed many kinds of knowledge, almost with the air she breathed. She could not, for example, have said how or at what moment she learned that she was a slave. She knew that her brothers and sisters, her father and mother, and all the other people who lived in the quarter, men, women, and children, were slaves. She had been taught to say, yes, missus, no missus, to white women, yes, master, no master, to white men, or <clears throat> yes, sir, no, sir. At the same moment, someone had taught her where to look for the North Star, the star that stayed constant, nor rising in the east and setting in the west, as the other stars appeared to do, and told her that anyone walking toward the north could use that star as a guide. She knew about fear, too. Sometimes at night, or during the day, she heard the furious galloping of horses, not just one horse, several horses, thud of the hoof beats along the road, jingle of harness. She saw the grown folks freeze into stillness, not moving, scarcely breathing while they listened. She could not remember who first told her that those furious hoofbeats meant the patrollers were going past in pursuit of a runaway. Only the slaves said patter rollers, whispering the word. Old Rit would say a prayer that the hoofbeats would stop. If they did, there would be the dreadful sound of screams because the runaway, the runaway slave had been caught, would be whipped, and finally sold to the chain gang. Thus Harriet had already shared the uneasiness and the fear of the grown-ups. <clears throat> but she shared their pleasures, too. She knew moments of pride when the overseer consulted Ben, her father, about the weather. Ben could tell if it was going to rain, <clears throat> when the first frost would come, tell whether there was going to be a long stretch of clear sunny days, Everyone on the plantation admired the skill of Ben's, even the master, Edward Brodus. The other slaves were rather in awe of Ben because he could prophesy, prophesy about, the weather too, about the weather. Harriet stood close to him when he studied the sky, licked his forefinger, and held it up to determine the direction of the wind, then announced that there would be rain or frost or fair weather. There was something free and wild in Harriet because of Ben. He talked about the arrival of the wild ducks the thickness of the winter coat of muskrats and of rabbits. He was always talking about the woods, the berries that grew there, the strange haunting cries of the, some of the birds, the sound their wings made when they were disturbed and flew up suddenly. He spoke of the way the owls flew, their feathers so soft that they seemed to glide soundless through the air. Ben knew about rivers and creeks and swampy places. He said that the salt water from the bay reached into the rivers and streams for long distances. You could stick your finger in the river water and lick it, and you could taste the salt from the bay. He had been all the way to Chesapeake. He had been storms. He had seen storms there. He said the big Buckwater River, which lay off to the southeast of the plantation, was just a little stream compared to the chop tank, and the chop tank was less than nothing compared to the bay. All through the plantation, from the big house to the staples, stables to the fields, he had a reputation for absolute honesty. He had never been known to tell a lie. He was a valued worker and a trusted one. Ben could tell wonderful stories, too. So could her mother, Old Rit, though Rit's were mostly from the Bible. Rit told stories about Moses and the children of Israel, about how the sea parted so that the children walked across dry land, about the plague of locusts, about how some of the children were afraid on the long journey to the promised land, and so cried out, It had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Old Rit taught Harriet the words of, so of that song that the slaves were forbidden to sing because of the man named Denmark Vesey, who had urged the other slaves to revolt by telling them about Moses and the children of Israel. Sometimes, in the quarter, Harriet heard snatches of it, sung under the breath, almost whispered, Go down, Moses. But she learned the words so well that she never had forgotten them. She was aware of all these things and many other things, too. She learned to separate the days of the week. Sunday was a special day. There was no work in the fields. The slaves cooked in the quarter and washed their clothes and sang and told stories. There was another special day, issue day, which occurred at the end of the month. It was the day what food... It was a day that food and clothes were issued to slaves. One of the slaves was sent to the big house with a wagon to bring back the monthly allowance of food. Each slave received eight pounds of pickled pork, or its equivalent in fish, 
one bushel of Indian meal, cornmeal, one pint of salt. Once a year on issue day, they received clothing. The men were given <clears throat> two tow linen shirts, two pairs of trousers, one of tow linen, the other woolen, and a woolen jacket for winter. The grown-ups received one pair of yarn stockings and a pair of shoes. The children under eight had neither shoes, stockings, jacket, nor trousers. They were issued two tow linen shirts a year. Shirt. Short, one-piece garments made of coarse material like burlap, reaching to the knees. These shirts were worn night and day. They were changed once a week. When they were worn out, the children went naked until the next allowance day. Men and women received a coarse blanket apiece. The children kept warm as best they could. And so Harriet knew about Sunday, <clears throat> which came once a week, about issue day, which occurred once a month. She learned to divide time into larger segments, too, based on changes of the season. There was seed time, when warmth began to creep back into the land. This was followed by the heat of summer. Then heat lay over the fields like a blanket. The bent backs of the field hands glistened in the sun, black backs wet with sweat. The fields seemed to shimmer in the sunlight. The overseer, a white man on horseback, stayed on the edge of the field, in the shade. He seemed to shimmer, too, as though all the heat of the sun were concentrated on him. A hot white light displaying over him, even though he lingered in the shade. When for some reason the slaves stopped their rhythmical singing, he would shout, Make a noise there, make a noise there, bare hand. And he cracked the black snake whip he carried. It made a hissing sound like a snake. After the heat of the summer, the year turned toward the fall. The nights began to grow cooler. Then, come the har then came harvest, one of the best times of the year, when the big full moon lit the fields and the slaves worked late, singing songs that had a lilt in them, songs that were like a thanksgiving for the abundance of the crop. Even better than that was the Christmas season, for Christmas was a long holiday, a whole stretch of days until after New Year's. The slaves had little work to do, they kept the fires going, looked after the animals, milked the cows, fed and watered the livestock. The gaiety and laughter from the big house reached all through the quarter. There were presents for everybody and rare treats of sweet cakes and bits of candy, gay ribbons. The quarter was as filled with the sound of singing and of laughter as the big house. Harriet thought that Christmas was the very best time of all. By tradition, there was no work. The holiday for the field slaves lasted as long as the yule log burned in the fireplace at the big house. So the people in the quarter spent days preparing the log. They chose a big, a big one, so big that the strongest field hands bent their backs under its weight. They soaked it in water <clears throat> so that it would burn slowly and for a long time. It was cold at Christmas time, cold in the winter there on the eastern shore. Yet Harriet liked the winter. She watched the flickering light from the fire. It cast long, dancing shadows against the smoke-darkened walls. She knew and liked the damp, earthy smell of the dirt floor. Even though they slept on the floor, huddled under thin, ragged blankets, aware of the chill, even though on windy nights puffs of smoke blew back in the, down the chimney, making them cough, yet she still liked the cold months when the fire was lit. At night, inside the cabin, she felt safe. But with the coming of morning, she was always a little frightened. In the early morning dark, not yet sunrise, but a grayness in the sky, a slight lifting of the darkness, she heard and recognized the long, low notes of the overseer's horn, calling the field hands to work. Then she would hear the sound of running feet, the sound of curses, the thud, thud of blows, falling on the head and back of the last field hand out of the quarter. And so at six, Harriet already knew fe fear and uneasiness. <clears throat> She knew certain joys, too, the joy of singing, the warmth from the pine knot fire in a fireplace, the flickering light that served as decoration, making shadows on the walls, changing, moving, dancing, concealing the lack of furniture. She was accustomed to the scratchy feel of the tow linen shirt she wore. Because she went barefooted, the soles of her feet were calloused, but the toes were straight, never having known the pinch of new shoes or any kind of foot covering. She was a solemn-eyed, shy little girl, slow of speech but quick to laugh. She was always singing or humming, under her breath, pausing in her play to look upward, watching the sudden free flight of the birds, listening to the Cherokee 
of the red-winged blackbirds, watching a squirrel run up the trunk of a tree in the nearby woods, studying the slow drift of cumulus clouds across the summer sky. This period of carefree idleness was due to end soon. The fierce old woman who looked after the children kept telling Minta that things would change. Whenever she saw the little girl stop to look at the trees, the sky, she repeated the same harsh-voiced warning. Overseer be setting you a task any day now. Then you won't be standing around with your mouth hanging open looking at nothing all day long. Overseer will keep me moving. Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, died at Monticello in Virginia on July 4, 1826. He was 83 years old. His original draft of the Declaration contained a vehement, a vehement philippic, philippic against Negro slavery. Congress eliminated this, but these words were left intact. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men were created equal, that they were are endowed by the Creator, by their Creator, with certain un unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This idea, part of Jefferson's legacy to America, written down in one of the country's noblest documents, was incompatible with the idea of legalized slavery. Yet it was an integral part of the heritage of all Americans, and so it troubled the minds of men in the North and in the South, long after Jefferson's death. Many a slave carried the dream of freedom in his heart because of these words of Jefferson's, not because the slave had read them, but because they were written down somewhere and other people had read them, and ideas are contagious, particularly ideas that concern the rights of man. And that is the end of chapter 3.